What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Einstein Bagels. Even you know, we have Einstein Bagels founder Noe talks about how several businesses he tried before Einstein Bagels did not work and the many stories. I've even had author of The Paleo Diet, Dr. Lauren Cordain, on to talk about The Paleo Diet and his decades of research. And you'll see how this relates to the guest today. Um, our sponsor today is Rise25.com, where entrepreneurs of six, seven, and eight-figure businesses come together live and in person every few months to solve their biggest business challenges and leave with lifelong friendships. Check out Rise25.com. It's run by myself and co-founder John Corcoran, and it's application only. Today, I'm very excited. We have Megan Reamer. She's founder of the potato chip company, Jackson's Honest. They have beautiful labeling. I'm sure you've seen the chips on shelves in grocery stores. She sells them all over the U.S. in eight countries in places like Whole Foods, Bed Bath & Beyond, Woodman's, just to name a few. Early on, they were even selected by the Academy Awards to be an exclusive snack food for the green room, executive suites, and backstage Beyond that, what's more impressive is Megan is a mother of four, and the company was inspired by their son Jackson's illness. Megan, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Mother of four and run a company. So how do you do it all? (laughs) I have a great husband. You look fairly relaxed also. (laughs) (laughs) No, it's just, you know, it's been a lot of fun, actually. It's, it's, um... It's something totally new for both of us. My husband still has his, you know, his real quote unquote day job. He does. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this, this, uh, you know, his role with Jackson's Honest is he works as our CFO yeah. and um, he does, you know, everything yeah. from from operations to financials to, and and of course it's his story as well and yeah. and our son Jackson. And so um, I want to talk about your son, effort, Megan. Sure. But I need to hear how you do it all. I mean, I'm being serious with that question. It's not a rhetorical question. Like, what does your day to day look like? Um, you know, it's it's just jam packed, really. There's no downtime. So it's you know hitting the ground running with getting kids off to school and then going to work and then going right to pick kids up from school yeah. and doing all the after school stuff and uh, and then starting work again probably like eight o'clock at night when when they're all in bed. I think just you know pretty typical mom um, stuff and and uh, entrepreneur stuff. So what time are you waking up usually, and what time are you going to bed usually? Uh. I get up around 5.30 yeah, and um, and then kind of, I don't know, bed is more around like 11, I'd say, 11.30, 11, something okay. like that. So yeah. talk about your son. Your son inspired this. What was yes. happening at the time? So my son has a really kind of epic story yeah. at this point. Um He's now 15 years old and he was born healthy and, and, you know, hit all the developmental milestones, walking, talking, doing everything he should. Um, and then at around age two, I had two kids at that point. My, my kids are 18 months apart, my older two. And, um, and at around age two, he just started to get a little bit of muscle weakness, like Mm -hmm. in his feet, um, really subtle. I thought I was imagining it at first and, and then it started to increase. And so that that muscle weakness kind of started to look like um, still in his feet. It started to look like kind of his feet would roll and he couldn't support the weight or he didn't want to support mm-hmm. the weight. But he still had head control and trunk control and, and leg control. And then that muscle weakness just gradually started to spread up his body. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, uh, the doctor started to finally take us seriously yeah. when he was having some problems, like equilibrium problems and some problems setting himself on his legs. Yeah. But he still had uh, trunk control and head control and fine motor and he could feed himself. And, and so it was this weird um, regression, a uh, motor regression. Yeah. And, and over the course of the next three years, like by age five, he had lost all of his gross and fine motor skills wow. and ended up in a wheelchair. That's and so crazy. we were frantically searching yeah. for As answers. As a parent, that's and, like the scariest thing you could experience. One of them. 
Yeah. 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 It was, it was not what I expected for sure. Um, and you know, I think you right or wrong, whether you agree with, uh, the physician or not, I think you go to a doctor expecting them to tell you what is wrong and what, how you go from there is up to you. Right. right. Like, do you do holistic medicine? Do you do a conventional kind yeah. of Western treatment, right? So your approach can vary and combine those things. But to go and not have them tell us anything and say, we really have no idea. They had no answers. This looks really weird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> le- you do not saying. want to hear that. No, you do not want to hear that. Um, I mean, I used to say, and I still believe it, that if, if they had told us, you know, he has, you know, this brain tumor or, you know, this type of cancer – it would have been better only in the sense that we would have known what it was and we could have directed all of our energy toward it. At where we were for years was just like a chicken with our head cut off. I mean, scrambling after everything we thought might help. Right. And so we were, um, you know, taking him around the country and, and going from doctor to doctor. And, and for, to, to my husband and I, just watching this regression, watching his daily symptoms, he had a lot of pretty serious GI issues. You know, he was eating an organic and a gluten-free diet, but uh, he wasn't absorbing any of the food. I mean, it was mm. good. It wasn't processed food. It was good quality foods. He wasn't gaining any weight. He was actively losing weight. Right. Um, and he was just deteriorating before us. And so, you know, we, uh, we kind of made this big assumption um, as this process was happening and he was continuing to lose more and more motor function that it was some kind of inflammatory-based problem. It looked so much like MS or ALS, and so we made this assumption that it was some type of autoimmune disorder that they Mm. just couldn't identify. Mm. Um, And we started to treat it that way. And the only method and the only Mm. means we had to do that was through his diet. You know, he wasn't on any medication. None of the doctors wanted to give him anything. So no one was giving him steroids or prednisone or anything to shut off his immune system. Mm. They were afraid of making things worse because they really had no idea what this dysfunction was. Mm. And so we just started to do a lot of research around his diet and and look at um, foods that we thought might be aggravating his neurological symptoms and his GI symptoms and foods that um, that weren't and just really putting him in these two categories at first. And then once we started to identify some of those foods, we realized that the foods we were taking out, we needed to replace with something. And so everything that we were putting in his body had to have a nutritional value. It wasn't just like, you know, um, let's cook, let's give him some grass fed liver, but we'll cook it in, you know, this canola oil or, you know, it was every piece of it had to matter and it did matter. And so, um, and so that's how we started to analyze his diet and just kind of break the food pyramid apart and look at the ratio of fats and carbs and proteins he was eating and then what types. And, yeah. and, you know, I think, um, I think at that point in time, there were, there was still a lot of information around carbs and, and good carbs and bad carbs and high fructose corn syrup is something you want to stay away from, but mm. maybe you want to substitute, you know, maple syrup or organic mm. cane sugar, even agave was big at that point. And yeah. so, um, You know, now, like in this right now where we are, plant-based foods and proteins are having their day in the sun and and people understanding the differences in the quality and the types of protein sources. And so... Um, so we were doing all of that, inf- all of that analysis and, and really zeroed in on the fats and recognizing, you know, in trying to feed him the most anti-inflammatory diet possible, right. recognizing that there was a difference in the types of fats that you, you put in your body and it, that, that fat and that oil was not just a vector to cook your food in, but it really mattered and it did something physiologically when you ate it. And, yeah. um, and so, you know, when we were taking things out of his diet, we really kind of zeroed in on replacing them with the right types of fats and recognizing that, you know, your brain is made up of fat, your central nervous system needs fat, um, and, and what types of fats are good quality. And so that's how we started to go down this road of, of kind of reverse engineering this paleo diet for him 12 right. years ago. Um, and, and that was um, not as common or prevalent at that time. It was not. It was really hard to get the foods we needed. Right. Um, you know, we were ordering raw milk from uh, California. Yeah. Um, 
We were like sourcing out farms that we could go to in Colorado for grass fed beef. And um, you, you definitely couldn't find what you needed on the shelf like you can now. Right. Um, but it yeah. was it Good was for a you lot to of, try and figure of... all that out. You know, that's that's not easy to do. Um, did they ever figure out what was the source or did they put a label on it or identify what was going yeah. on with Jackson? Oh, uh, yeah. My son finally got a diagnosis 12 years later. Mm. Um, and uh, and it was just so it was just two years ago that he got it. And we took him to the National Institute of Health. They have an undiagnosed disease program. So the NIH in Washington, D.C., mm. it's a great resource. I will, you know, shout its accolades from the rooftop. There are 14 um, institutes that make up our collective, like federally funded national institutes of health. Yeah. And they do amazing things there. You know, it's not like a walk in clinic that you can be seen, right. but they drive most of the research that happens and gets filtered out to, um, you know, places like MD Anderson for different cancer protocols. Right. And, um, and so their undiagnosed disease program, they basically ran every test he'd ever had. Uh, already done and then um, just started to do like whole genome sequencing and whole exome sequencing for him wow. and through that process a year later exactly a year later they call us and said they had a diagnosis for him and it is this rare autoimmune disorder that he has um, just this spontaneous event that happened much like someone who gets MS right there's really no genetic or right. ALS there's no genetic component to that right. um, that's what my son's disorder it's something called Icardi Gutierrez syndrome and it's it's named after the two uh, two doctors who discovered it hmm. um, and he's one of like seven kids in the world that Ooh. have it yeah and so um, so we got that diagnosis two years ago, and since then, things have seemed to move pretty rapidly that he's now part of an experimental drug trial mm. um, to try to mediate some of that inflammatory response and see if we can or he can regain some of his motor skills and, mm. you know, just just like not live with that state of inflammation all the time. Right. Now that they've identified it, they can take some steps to kind of really laser focus in on what the main source what could be causing it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They they know the like dysfunctional pathway in his body, yeah. and so that's half the battle. Yeah. I mean, really, it was. I almost thought if we got a diagnosis, it would be this bittersweet thing, right? Like yeah. we know, and now we know, right? That it would be this even some type of you know life sentence or death sentence on him. That right. you know it's it's incurable, and and this is a bleak outlook or something. But it really has not been. It's been this right. rallying That's place great. for us to get behind and um, and support and support through what we're doing with the chips, and you know be able to drive research and devote some funding toward it. And um, it's all in a really good positive yeah. place. That's fantastic. Because I remember yeah. when I was doing the research and I was reading up, one of the scariest things that I read was the um, where he had the pancreatitis, and it, I think it said like the third day in the hospital he weighed he was three and a half and he weighed seventeen pounds. Yes, yes. I can't even picture that. It was bleak. It was, you know. Um, it was probably the lowest point for him, and, and you know, anecdotally for us, I guess, but. Um, he, yeah, I mean, they gave us morphine and sent us home and said, wow. uh, you know, I hope the transition goes smoothly. Horrible. And we were like, what do we do now? And so it's really kind of where we started to, um, do a lot more research around his diet. And, and we had this copy of Nourishing Traditions, you know, Weston A. Price cookbook on our, on our shelf. And, yeah. Um, and, and really started to get deeper into that. And, and that's really what changed him. There's this really foul, not foul, that's not the right word. Not a great tasting baby formula. I have recipe. it written right under this question, which is within a week. And I, I had to ask about it because I'm like, yeah. what? It's a, within a week of being on Sally Fallon's meat-based formula, this helped. And I'm thinking, what is a meat-based formula? 
is gross. It's like, you know, we were making bone broth. So, so, so stuff like that now that you can find on the shelf, like, I think it's great that it's, right. there's bone broth in a box, right? right. Um, Cause we just had bones cooking 24 hours a day, seven days a week at our house and, and adding like dulse and, and Celtic sea salt and, you know, everything we needed right. in that broth we were adding. And so, um, and so this meat based this meat-based formula is, you know, homemade bone broth. Um, it's it's like grass-fed liver that's really been slow cooked and kind of partially digested by the time you're even grinding it up. So it it's been slow cooked for like six to eight <laughs> hours at 200 degrees in the bone broth. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then we were to add you know, the types of oils that we, we wanted in there. So cod liver oil and coconut oil and, um, butter and, um, you know, a little bit of lactose, but really, you know, more, more heavy on the fat, like a pretty keto right. formula. Yeah. Um, and it really started to, it's all great for a year and a half. I mean, he would just suck this formula down every few hours, like babies do like a baby formula. Um, and it really started to turn him around. It was very nourishing. It was yeah. very supportive. It was what his body needed. And uh, and we were able to, you know, create it ourselves and dial it in when oh. the doctors wanted us to take, um, you know, the, the like food-based, the medically-based formula that is all sucrose or glucose and, yeah. you know, very sugar-based. And yeah. so um, we were trying to avoid that and still keep, them happy. I mean, they were still monitoring him in a way that, um, you know, we needed to change it for him pretty quickly and, yeah. and get some weight back on him. Um, and, and we were able to do that through this very, yeah. you know, nourishing, uh, formula. Yeah. Congrats. That's amazing. And this kid's a fighter. I mean, <laughs> he's a fighter. He's a fighter you yeah. know, beyond belief. It um, it's, it's been, it's, it's been, a, it's been an interesting journey. I think any parent who goes through, you know, anything like that. I mean, parents whose yeah. kids have food allergies and they don't know it till their child eats that. And then they're in this, you know, very critical situation sometimes. I mean, it's all very anxiety provoking and nerve wracking. And, you know, you come out of it on the other side, a different person. Yeah. So when did chips enter into the picture? Why chips? I know the chips are just this very Because I can picture you now that I'm thinking of it. It seems like a logical thing. Like you should have a bone broth company. Like what? Why, why, why chips? Yeah, you think. Right. <laughs> that would be more logical. Right. In fact, when we first started telling people we were starting this chip company, they would, they would like stand there and scratch their head. Like, I'm like, oh, well, you know, it's just a function of Jackson and his story. And they're still standing there staring at me like, what in the world are you talking about? Um, so the chips are just something we made at home because we, we were making everything from scratch. You know, we really weren't buying anything in a bag or um, in a can. And right. so um, we were all eating this pretty strict paleo diet and I was craving something crunchy really bad, like right, right. really bad. Um, that was my, you know, it wasn't candy or chocolate or anything that was my – my my comfort food it was yeah. a potato chip or something salty right. so um i think my husband just got tired of listening to me complain about not being able to buy something on the shelf and so we started cooking them in our house and we first started making them with lard um lard's really fussy and uh and needs to be just the perfect temperature and if you don't eat them as soon as they're cooked they don't save very well oh, really? so yeah. we were still eating them but we kind of were experimenting in our kitchen and made yeah. them with tallow and same thing um and then just started making them with coconut oil because we were all eating a lot of coconut oil as a healthy fat and a good saturated fat yeah. and so you know we dialed in that process and realized oh these taste pretty good let's just stick with these but right. we kept looking on the shelf for somebody else to start making them so right. that it could be super convenient for us to So you don't have to, to be at home and be cooking them. You could just buy them and not worry about it. And what did yeah, you find? Exactly. What was on the shelves at the time? What were you finding? Oh, we were just finding like kettle brand, you know, everything that was in Boulder Canyon that were still cooked in a polyunsaturated vegetable, you know, a safflower or a, yeah. a canola. And we were really strictly avoiding those. Yeah. And so... Um, then we started to see like Boulder Canyon start making some avocado oil chips, right, or olive oil, and 
And those were certainly better choices, but it wasn't exactly what we were looking for. And so when we started to see those alternative oils crop on the shelf, I thought, okay, somebody's definitely going to start making these. Like we can't keep making these at home. And right. you know, it's not like we were making them nightly, but we were making them at least weekly. Yeah. And and then we started to give them to friends and you know bring them to potlucks. I mean, we're from this tiny little town in Colorado. Um, a lot of potluck suppers happen with friends and. Right. Um, and so we'd bring them to these places and people were like, wow, these chips are great. Have you ever thought of selling these? These chips are delicious. And, uh, and we said, no, we have, no, we're pretty busy. Like, I don't think we're going to be able to do that. Yeah. Um, but I think it just planted this seed because we didn't see them start showing up on the shelf. And we knew that we were getting tired of making them. And we thought maybe other people were looking for them, right. particularly as the paleo, um, diet started to become a lot more popular and, and this was when like coconut water was on the scene and people were understanding all parts of the coconut and, yeah. and the nutritional value that um, each part of that coconut provides. And so we just started to, to think about it a lot more seriously. So when was the first time you actually sold the chips? We sold them in July 2012. And we sold them to our little health food store. So, mm -hmm. we're, so we live in Crested Butte, Colorado. Yeah. It's like... Um, a town at 9,000 feet with, you know, 2,000 full-time people and, and literally a kind of at the end of the road in the mountains and it's a little ski town, 200 miles southwest of, of Denver in the Front Range. Um, hard to get supplies, you know, hard to, to get anywhere from there. Right. Um, so we sold them at our little health food store. But a lot of people come to Crested Butte in the summer for hiking and mountain biking in particular. And yeah. so... Um, so we we it had taken us probably three weeks to make like 50 bags and we had little yeah. snack size you know 1.5 ounce bags yeah. so we were slicing the potatoes with a mandolin you know um frying them weighing them uh sealing them and uh so how we are brought you sealing them, them like so what did the original package look like i mean right now I'm, it looks beautiful like if anyone's seen the packaging it's like a person with like a hoe and there's like a nice background to it. It's a nice package. Yeah. What was it at the time? What did it look like? Uh, it was it was kind of, you know, this is a more, the current packaging is a more updated version, okay. but it still had a farmer with a boy with yeah. a hoe in a field. Um, and he was like looking off into the mountain, you know, setting and... Um, it wasn't much different. Yeah. This one is sort of a more abstract version, right. the current packaging. I guess um, I'm asking was, because did you just have these packages sent to your house and you'd scoop them? And I'm just yeah. – because usually when you buy these packages, they make you buy huge quantities, right? How many yeah, did we you, did. Oh, you did? <laughs> well, we did. Yeah, we bought – I mean we didn't have 100,000 impressions like they normally make you buy, but we had like – you know, I think we had like 25,000 impressions. It's a lot of bet. Run that yeah. And they just shipped them to your house. And how did you, you just scooped them? How did and you they were like, they were square. Right. They weren't like perfect. They were more rectangle right. um, shape. And uh, it, it felt like a lot. Like we thought, oh my gosh, what are we getting into? Right, 25,000 right. bags. How are we ever going to sell that many? Right. Um, and, you know, we were getting potatoes from the um, from the local farmers. So, yeah. you know, it wasn't like we had this, you know, really uh, precise potato supply. Right. Um, we were picking them up weekly and um, wow. and getting them from yeah. – there's a – the other side of sort of the mountain from Crested Butte, the pass, is this great fertile valley um, where uh, like Paonia, these towns called Paonia and Hotchkiss, it's on the western slope of Colorado. Um, it's really, um, it's a great grow place to grow crops. Yeah. And so that's where we were sourcing yeah. all of our potatoes. Yeah. Um, There's a video so that your, of your husband meeting like out there of your husband oh, yeah. talking with the farmer and these are non-GMO yeah. grown potatoes and they're like hand picking them. Like how are they making tens of thousands of bags and it's from this locally grown <laughs> sourced potato. Yeah. Yeah. He was one of our first farmers. There's yeah. another uh, couple that live near him. They were one of our first farmers too. And, and we were just buying like two, three, 400 pounds of potatoes weekly. Wow, that's crazy. So you were doing this in your kitchen at the time early on. We were doing it at a commercial kitchen. Oh, commercial kitchen. Okay. Yeah. 
And so, um, which there aren't many of, and we were kind of going from kitchen to kitchen because we were going in there at night when everybody else was done cooking during the day. Right. So we take all of our things and our oil and our pans. We had a friend who was a welder in Crested Butte and he custom fabricated these stainless steel pans for us to use. Um, and we would just go there at eight o'clock at night and start slicing potatoes and wow. fry them up and, and bag funny. them and weigh them. And so we had a vacuum sealer heat sealer. And um, and so our first retailer was this little uh, shop called Mountain Earth in Crested Butte. Yeah. Tiny little store. Yeah. Um, and and, and we, they almost sort of did it as a favor because we had been going in there forever and they were friends. And we said, hey, we're making these potato chips and they're cooked in coconut oil. And would you guys maybe be interested in selling them? And, you know, he said, well, what's the wholesale price? And we were like, uh, you know, we had to, <laughs> it was really kind of, you know, it was well thought out, but not well thought out. And so you know, we had to dial in all that information and get the specifics. And right. so um, so we did that and we dropped them off on like a Thursday. And Friday morning, the owner called me and said, Megan, we need more chips. We already sold out. We need bigger bags and we need more flavors. How many, wait, so how many <laughs> bags did you drop cry, off? It had taken us so long to make them. That's the best <laughs> phone call you could make, get, I guess. <laughs> But now you're like, okay, we're we're in for it. How many bags did you drop off? That was in one day. We dropped off like fifty. In one day, they sold yeah. fifty bags just yeah, in yeah. a small grocery store. Yeah, a tiny little grocery store. And that was sort of my point. Crested Butte gets really crowded in the summer with like a lot of out of towners, a lot of Texans visit Crested Butte, mm. a lot of front range like Boulder and Denver people and um and so these folks were like going back home and going to their stores and asking their stores to bring in these chips. Mm. Well, like we we weren't even in any place to provide chips to right. any other retailer, really. I mean, we made them by hand from from July until uh, April of 2013. Wow. And so we had a really hard time keeping up with uh, demand and and we started selling them online in September of 2012 and that that really um, skyrocketed I mean we you know had one face we had a Facebook page we had kind of a placeholder website and we were selling out of chips so quickly that um, we had to open we had to like control the inventory so we'd make chips every single night We'd come in the morning and we'd say, okay, order, like you can order, ordering's open. And we'd have maybe, I don't know, 200, 300 bags we'd made the night before and they'd sell out in 10 minutes. Wow. And so that was our, you know, that was our pattern. That was our process. Nightly we were going and um, kind of around and then like all day Saturday, all day Sunday making chips. And So at the um, time, how many kids do you have at this time? Three? I had four. You had four kids at the time? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy, and, Megan. Yeah. Some of them were helping. Uh, one of my older daughters was helping. Like she would get her hairnet on and throw chips into the oil and stir them around and do what we needed to do. But um, but I think it was like around January of 2013 where my husband, who still was you know working his real job during the day, said, yeah. I, I can't keep doing this. Like I have tendonitis in my elbow. Mm -hmm. I can't keep There's some There's something chips. online that basically is like, oh, what do you do for the company? He says, I'm slave labor or something. <laughs> 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 yes, he is. He still is. Yeah. Um yeah, he 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 worked hard and we were just, you know, it was fun actually. It was really um it just felt really good then and and it still does to to turn this into something fun and exciting. Like this you know, this story and this experience for with my son just changed our life dramatically. Yeah. And you know, he still lives in a wheelchair. He still needs everything done for him. You know, he 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 needs to be fed. He needs to be changed. I mean, he right. has a, a significant disability. Cognitively, he's fine and right. he's happy and engaged and communicates, you know, through a, a assistive technology. And but um but but his day to day is is still pretty intense. And so, 
you know, it's, it's nice to create this larger um, story about yeah. what we've been through and share yeah. it and, yeah. and have, you know, I hear people say like, it, particularly when we first started out and at this little health food store in Crested Butte, you know, I'd be in there shopping and I'd hear people come in and say, hey, where are those Jackson's chips? I mm. love those Jackson's chips. And I'd literally start crying. Like, right. you know, it, it just, um, yeah. it, it's so meaningful to us as right. a family and to, to me as his mom. Yeah. So hold up the bag. You have a couple of bags there. And I, I, I told I you do. before I have them and I was going to save them, but I ate them and threw them out. Um, so we have the sweet potato there. <laughs> and then if people are listening to this, sweet obviously. Sweet potato was one of our first ones. It was. Okay. Yeah. What was the first one it's, that you sold? So that's sea salt. This is the first one. Sea salt. Sea salt was the first one. Yep. Sea salt was the first one. And then we quickly added sweet potato because we – on our diet, the way we were eating, we were eating a lot of sweet potato chips yeah. cooked in cooking oil. Yeah, yeah. I've had the purple heirloom and the sweet potato. Both are really, really good. Um, Thank you. So what did the progression go? Like the person said, we need more flavors, right? The, the person, yeah. so what do you do? I mean, you're already overwhelmed with the one flavor in the bags. What do you do next? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We were I, we kind of just stuck with the one flavor, sea salt. Um, that's all we could do because we weren't in a place that we could try to start sourcing good seasonings like non-GMO organic seasonings. Right. Um, you know, we were still like everything was just poured right back into the business, right? Any right. any uh, money, any like any uh, supplies that we were purchasing, that was all like self-funded stuff, and right. so. We wanted to make sure that we knew what the process was before we expanded into any other flavor, right? right. So Smart. we knew we couldn't keep up the process we had making them by hand. So we had to start looking at, you know, a manufacturing facility and how could we find someone to partner with us. And, you know, that process took a few months. And then once we found that partner, that still took like six to nine months to dial in the process that we were going to use. You know, they had been, um, they were used to uh, a, a pretty traditional cooking method for potato chips, right. which was, you know, high heat for a very short amount of time. Right, yeah. And, um, and that's not, you know, that's not what we were doing. And so, um, and so once we kind of dialed in that process and felt really comfortable with it, then we could look at what other flavors can we introduce and what other potato varieties can we introduce. Um, you know, the purple heirloom was something that we introduced in like almost two years ago, late 2014. Okay. We did it as a special, um, a special exclusive with Whole Foods. Yeah. And so we launched there. And then after um, 90 days, we started selling them in other retailers. And they've been one of our really popular flavors for yeah. sure. That seems – now it's making sense a little bit when I look on there. It makes sense now. Instead of changing the seasonings, you change the potato, right? Yeah. So you go, you can go purple heirloom, sweet potato, and regular, you know, in the in the potato, because it's probably much easier to do that than like dial in all these different herbs. But you still have barbecue and maple cinnamon. Maple cinnamon's new. Yeah, okay. that's a seasonal sweet potato flavor. We just launched it this year. It's good. Um, it's kind of tastes like a dessert chip. But right. yeah, I mean, I think that. It's it's both of those things. You know, we want to make sure that the seasonings and the flavor profiles that we're offering are are true to what we eat, right? right. So they have to be non-GMO. They have to be organic seasonings. And it's really hard to source those, um, even really basic ones, yeah. and get the same flavor yeah. that people are used to. And, like and so said, like, like a coconut sugar tastes yeah. different than cane sugar, right? right? So. Right. It's just trying to also be true to the flavor you're trying to get. Yeah. And that original grocery store, they ask you, what is it wholesale at, right? Because you're doing it handcrafted, you have more expensive ingredients, what do you decide to price it? What do you tell them they need to price it at? Because it's probably more expensive than normal potato chips, obviously. Yeah, they started out that way for sure. Yeah. Um, like the five ounce bag that we started on the shelf with. So the first retailer that launched us was Natural Grocers, which used to be Vitamin Cottage. Okay. Um, they were great. They've been fantastic partners for us. That was three years ago, October of 2013. When they launched us on the shelf, we were $4.99 a bag, which is 
an unheard of price in that yeah. chip aisle, right? Because right, right. you know potato chips are essentially a commodity, so right. people are used to paying like what a dollar twenty nine, a dollar ninety nine, maybe a little bit more for a kettle or a Boulder Canyon, like a two forty nine or three twenty nine or something. So, um, so you know, our goal when we started was not to be this premium, expensive chip. Right. It was just the nature of. Right. Being a small mom and pop, right? Well, not having economies of scale. Yeah. Well, also and, the ingredients too. I mean, it's not just and small the ingredients. mom and pop. Yeah. The coconut oil yeah. costs a lot more than, uh, you know, canola oil. Yeah. And you don't get the same like rate of reuse, right? So, yeah. so those, those companies that use a vegetable oil, they can reuse that a lot right. where, you know, you're not really adding much to it to continue to use it. Right. Um, the coconut oil just acts differently by right. the nature of the type of fat that it is. Right. And so, um, so you know, once we were able to achieve a certain growth, um, we were able to lower the price to three ninety nine dollars every day. And so that was a real accomplishment for us. It was something we really worked hard to do. Yeah. Um, because, you know, it's, it's, it's more the message and the mission of the company. It's not that we want to be this expensive potato chip and we're premium and you can right. only buy them at right. Whole Foods because yeah. you have your certain income level, right? Yeah. We want them to be available at Piggly yeah. Wiggly and Winn Dixie and Kroger and you know Wegmans, where where they are some of those places already available at a price point that people aren't afraid of because yeah. you know it's really about the story and the mission and the fat and and understanding the good fats. Yeah. So Megan, talk about the growth of the different the store. So you start off as mom and pop. Take me, where else do you go from there um, as far as, you know, Whole Foods? When do you get in Whole Foods and Bed Bath & Beyond and Woodman's from this small mom and pop grocery on the side of a mountain? Yeah. Um, so, so where do you go next? August or October 2013 was the first retailer, Natural Grocers. They put us in, they had about 70 stores, 75 stores. That's a lot, then. yeah. It's a lot. Yeah. And we had one flavor, one skew, sea salt. Um, and it was great. It was a great place for us to kind of work through the kinks. You know, there's always kinks in in, in uh, that first distribution yeah. channel. Yeah. And so, and so they were great partners. what are some partners. things for the, when you say kink, what did you have to work through for your first distribution? Because that's a lot of stores. It's a lot of stores. Yeah. For us, it was around like getting the product to the stores, right? Yeah. So... So this opportunity with Natural Grocers um, allowed us to get into several different warehouses through UNFI, which is you know the largest natural and organic distributor. Um, and so they basically uh, turned on those warehouses for us. Well, you know, we'd been direct shipping up until that point. Right. So we needed we, myself and Scott, my husband, needed to understand, freight and logistics mm -hmm. and you know what is a bol i didn't even know what a bill of lading was and you know Neither so it was this <laughs> very quick up to speed like about about how you get products somewhere and then um you know how it gets into the warehouse and then how it gets onto the shelves and what you know we needed to manage as part of that right it wasn't just like we were getting it to the warehouse and then it was magically getting right. on the shelves and still needed to follow up through that whole process so just understanding that that like grocery chain and yeah. how it operated from 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 vendor to distributor to retailer and and how we needed to manage that process and so um you know we we it was a great place for us to learn learn a lot of that information and then in january of 2014 we we're on the shelf. We got put on the shelf of our local Rocky Mountain region for Whole Foods hmm. with two SKUs. So we had um, we had sea salt and we had salt and vinegar at that point. And then sweet potato came pretty quickly after that. Yeah. And then just throughout 2014, um, we added more regions for Whole Foods. Uh, I think like Pacific Northwest was next and a lot of kind of independent smaller chains as well as mom and pop stores yeah. in the Pacific Northwest. They started to put us on the shelves because just as that part of the country, they really got the coconut oil. It was less of an educational process right. and more of a, oh, cool, somebody's finally making these, right? Like they were already in right. that space of right. understanding why the coconut oil. So, um, you know, what we saw was that we started to get on the shelves 
in those places that pretty much understood right. why it was coconut oil. So yeah. Northern California, then right. Southern California. The people who are health, and, they're health conscious in general. Like they're yeah, they were just in a different yeah. place. And then it spread east. And so it definitely went west to east. And and I'd say we started to go on the shelves like we started working with Wegmans um, earlier this year um, and Publix earlier this year as well. And I think that there are there's a there's just a lot of folks. There's a larger demographic than we realized in starting the company of folks that were looking specifically for this type of alternative oil um, and understanding why. And so, uh, just on an educational level, I think you know um, uh, what we saw in the West. The rest of the country is is there now. Yeah. You know, and there are it still takes like there's a certain where, time frame where it's like okay. It hits Cal- Colorado, Northern California in like a year or two. This will catch on to exactly. out east. Yeah, pretty much. That's good. I you mean, your that's finger what on the pulse of these things. What's that? You can keep your finger on the pulse of these things because you're seeing this stuff well, first. Um, I mean, that's what that's how it worked for us. Yeah. I think that other other people I know in the same boat, like launching new products and and particularly whatever that ingredient deck looks like, if it's a little, you know off the curve. Um, I think that's been their experience too. Yeah. So was it very difficult to get into Whole Foods for the first time? Um, no, no, it really wasn't. I mean, because we went on a regional level and so we really worked closely with the buyer that we had um, for the Rocky Mountain region and and really wanted to make sure that the lessons we took from natural grocers we brought to the table and, and understood also how uniquely Whole Foods operated and um, just be great partners. And that's what we've tried to do in each region. So we didn't want to take on more than we could chew. Um, it's too late for that. Bite though, off right? more than we could chew, I yeah. guess, is the right way to say it. Um, and so we'd, we'd go into like the Rocky Mountain region and work through the unique kinks of Whole Foods and understand, you know, that distribution channel and that retailer. And then, you know, add another region, which operated a little bit differently than, you know, Rocky Mountain. And so um, we did it. Very, we've had a, a pretty quick growth, but we did it very intentionally, and 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 it feels sort of uh, slow um, because it wasn't our 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 focus to just get on the shelf in as many places as possible as quickly as possible. Um, you know, it's really to build a, a yeah. solid, um, good company with good people and a great team, and you know, uh, a good you know financial background. So it sounds like you take on one, you kind of figure out the landscape with one, and then you kind of move to another, figure out the the kinks and landscape and move on to another. And that's... Yeah, there's a lot to be learned from each retailer that we work with. They're all different. They're all unique. There's certainly some common threads. But, um, you know, we at the end of the day, we really just want to be great partners with everyone that we're working with and, you know, support them the right way through promotions, through displays, through um, coupons, whatever it is specific yeah. to that retailer. We want to make sure that financially we're in a good place to do that and um, and just brand like with our brand and the potato chips that we're offering and the varieties. You know, we have tortilla chips now as well. And so. Um, yeah, I mean, it's this very intentional uh, program, I think, or plan. Yeah. Sometimes it's out of our control, but. So, Megan, what would you wish you'd known then that you know now with going into these grocery stores? Um, you know, it's funny because I think when we first started, you know, when we were making them by hand and our our baseline, my husband and I said to each other, if we see these, like if we saw this bag on the shelf at Whole Foods, boom, high five, like we did it. That's awesome. And, <laughs> I, you know, it's just the tip of the iceberg, really. Right. It's like, you know, okay, now it's on the shelf. Now you got to keep it on the shelf. And now you have to, you know, provide more offering and you have to compete against these guys and you have to, you know, play in the same ballpark. And so um, – I think I just wish I knew how yeah. it's much definitely a marathon um, and and that, you know, there are certain goals that we've been able to achieve that really feel like 
um, a pat on the back for ourselves, goals that we set for ourselves. Mm. And, and that was one of them, right? Like, wow, this would be great to see this bag on the shelf at Whole Foods that now we can, then we can pack it in. Like we did it, we achieved it. And <laughs> <laughs> it's just this slippery slope after that. Like, um, and I think even just, you know, kind of going on the shelf at, at Publix, for instance, like that's a milestone for yeah, us. You know, we, yeah. um, we were hoping we that was something a partner we'd be able to work with Wegmans as well, um, and and to see the support that they've shown us and to see the sales that we have with their you know their customers get it and and more and more people are understanding, yeah. you know um, why we use coconut oil. Yeah, I mean these are they're all huge milestones, and once you you know certain things out of your control, right? What are some things in your control that help you compete obviously the quality you know goes without saying right what what are some other things like with whole foods that there's like a million chips in that aisle right yeah. how do you compete you know we just try to we just try to get people tasting our chips and let the taste speak for itself and let the quality of the product speak for itself you know we believe in what we're doing we believe in our process we believe in the quality we believe in the team we've got a great team of people who really understand you know specifics and details around gross the grocery business better than i do yeah. and so um i think that you know they're able to also work individually with each retailer to make it work for them too, right? Like, when do we want to put these chips on promotion and how do we want to do that? And what kind of price? And, you know, um, just finding a common place uh, that, that makes it work for them and makes it work for us. And then I think, uh, but just at the end of the day, we just try to get a lot of demos and get people yeah. sampling and get chips in people's mouths and let them taste for themselves. And, yeah. Um, keep it in this really positive place of why we're doing what we're doing. Yeah. So obviously you go from making it until 2 a.m., um, you and your husband and, and a family, to hiring team members. Um, when do you hire and, or who do you hire for your first um, staff? And then, cause, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So um, it actually came full circle because the first – person that we hired was our old buyer for the Rocky Mountain region for Whole Foods. Mm. Um, and she was our director of sales, just period. She, she was like the natural and organic director of sales, but she was um, for that channel, but she was handling all inbound um, inquiries for uh, the chips. And so she started in January of 2015. So she was working for Whole Foods at the time. She was working for Whole Foods at the time. Yes. We were... Um, stunned that she, that she wanted to leave that opportunity. Yeah. She had a great job there right. and um, come and work with us. What did she say? Why did she say she she was ready to move over and just wanted to be with Jackson's Honest? She really liked uh, our brand. She really liked the quality of what we were producing and she really liked the story and she liked the mission behind it. And, um, yeah. and she had a great rapport with Scott and I from working closely together. And yeah. so... She was ready to be part of something from the ground up and start something. I mean, we we like she created the process she wanted, and everyone who's joined us um, has been able to yeah. craft their their role the way they wanted it to be. Yeah. And so, um, you know, it's certainly a risk for someone to leave a a position right. like that or any other you know sales position with a more established company, but. Um, they've had a lot of autonomy and they've had a lot of, you know, wide berth to um, to create their space the way they wanted to. And 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 they're all excited about it. So she was the first one in January 2015. Um, the second person joined us. She's our like office manager, sort of, you know, logistics, internal logistics person, keeps everybody on the straight and narrow. Um, she was May of 2015. And then we hired another salesperson in September of 2015. And then we hired an operations person who was also an employee of Whole Foods. He was the the uh, the buyer that we hired. Jessica, her name is. He was her boss at Whole Foods. Um, he was the grocery mm. coordinator for the region. And he joined a year ago in December. And he's really just... Um, 
you know, each person that's joined has been able to kind of institutionalize or create process and right. standards right. around the roles. And so, you know, we were still, I was still responding to uh, POs until probably earlier this year when yeah. he was able to take it over 100%. Um, but we were still using like Excel spreadsheets and stuff to do yeah. that, you know, um, and kind of like running this parallel spreadsheet QuickBooks business. So um, it's just, you know, craft like yeah. created a, a, a process yeah. around, you know, becoming a larger company yeah. and, and your mission that and product has attracted rock stars. It seems. <laughs> it's, that's exactly right. We've been really fortunate with the people who've joined us and um, they do, they do a, an enormous amount of work. I mean, we have a pretty small team still, um, you know, certainly less than 10 people and, and it's uh, Herculean is, is what their, their job is. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So are they local? Do they come into one office or are they all remote? How does it work? They come into one office. We have an office in Boulder now, oh. and um, all but one uh, salesperson works there. Wow. So yeah. you mentioned Excel. So yeah. I want to hear about some. what is some of the software and things now that you use to, to run the company. I think I saw um, the, the site is on Shopify, but I think most people just buy it in the, in the grocery stores and things like that. Yeah, they do. Um, we do have still online orders that we take through Shopify. Um, we use QuickBooks right now. Um, we're transitioning to an enterprise software system in January that we're really excited about. Mm -hmm. um, we think it's just, it's, it's, it's a little bit early to do it, but it's also this kind of, I think it's this narrow window of getting locked into QuickBooks where you then can't transition to something like this enterprise system. So um, so we're excited to do that. We think it's going to be a pretty meaningful change to the way we operate our business and the mm -hmm. access that everyone can have to um, the state of the business at, at any point in time. Any other tools or softwares that you use on a daily basis that allow you to run your life or, or business that be important for everyone to know? <laughs> No, really no. not. <laughs> Just my Google Calendar. <laughs> Google Calendar, exactly. Yes. Um, so flavors. Um, how do you decide when to release a new flavor? Because it's obviously a lot of time, energy, money, work. And you start with the sea salt, and then you went to the the uh, the sweet potato um, and the, or the vinegar. Um, yeah. So how do you decide what when to release uh, a new flavor? There's not really much science behind it. Yeah. Um, That's okay. I'm curious really, your process. Yeah. It's like yeah, you could no, have eaten a donut one. Or you don't eat donuts, but if you did, it's like, oh, I had this maple <laughs> cinnamon donut. Like, let's make a maple cinnamon chip. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Kind of. No. Yeah. Um, you know, we uh, we were fooling around with, like, maple cinnamon is a good example because we were talking about it a year ago. Um, and just wanting to do something with the sweet potato and do it in the fall when it's, you know, mm -hmm. this, that seasonal time and Thanksgiving and, um, and we just didn't have the, it, we just couldn't line it up. Like we didn't know what kind of spice blend we wanted to use. We didn't want to do like a pumpkin spice thing, but, um, but we wanted it to be this fall flavor. And so, you know, I think it was, it's just a timing thing, like how, far in advance, we need to look at creating the new packaging and getting the spice blend created and then going through the iterations right. of, you know, adding more cinnamon or, or nutmeg or whatever is in it. Right. And so, um, it's really just sort of what we have the bandwidth for. Right. Like right now we're gearing up because we have these tortilla chips. And so we've had three, uh, flavors. We've had a blue corn, a yellow corn, and we've had this salsa fresca flavor. Yeah. So we're sort of relaunching this tortilla program in January, and we're going to do um, a restaurant style of blue corn, yellow corn, and a sprouted red tortilla, red mm. corn tortilla. And then we're also doing three smaller bags, like five ounce bags of flavored. So we're doing the salsa fresca in the smaller bag. Um, we're doing like a churro, kind of a maple um, cinnamon tortilla. Right. And um, we're doing a lime with sea salt. And so, you know, that's that's been a real focus for us where I don't like it's put any kind of potato chip flavor on hold because yeah. 
we're uh, we're really excited about the tortilla platform. And you know, those are organic, non-GMO, obviously cooked in coconut oil. So, right. um, you know, it's really kind of just I think what um, what lines up when, and and you know, yeah. possibly looking at doing something for the summer with potato chips next year. But you know, it's something we have to kind of start thinking about right now in order to get all the film that we need and the packaging done. So is it like about a year in advance for you to, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. For us, you know, we're a small company and so it takes us that long to, to make sure we have the cash flow we need to create packaging that we're not going to sell for a while, you know, and, um, it's just small business stuff and, and the timeframe. Well, that's what I'm curious about with the process because is it if you get a certain number of requests, is there anything with the customer feedback? Like uh, if someone – are people emailing you or calling and saying, I'd love this. I would love if you had this flavor. What kind of customer feedback have you taken in that uh, you know has caused you to create a flavor or maybe not create a flavor? Yeah, we get a lot of customer feedback. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the largest uh, kind of initiative we've done for the customer, based on customer feedback, are the tortilla chips. Mm. Like as soon as the potato chips were on the shelf yeah. and people were getting those and getting access to those and saying, oh, I'm so happy you're doing this and I'm so excited about the coconut oil and finally someone's doing this. You know, really the same things that my husband and I were saying. Um, it was pretty quickly thereafter that we kept getting these inquiries around, you know, tortilla chips and right. no one's doing this in the tortilla space. And so... Launching those was was, you know, it was not a hundred percent based on customer feedback, but it was pretty significant. Right. So you come out yeah. with the tortilla chip, or whatever flavor. How do you then launch it to the public? Like, how do you decide? Well, okay, I mean, do you go back into all these stores you're already in, and you can release the bags there? Or what's the the launch process? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really going back to the retailers that we've partnered with for a while. Um, Whole Foods has been a great partner in our in our one of our you know sort of longest um, uh, retailers that we've been working with and and by longest you know that's like two years and so um, but uh, natural grocers as well you know we'll go to them for instance with the maple cinnamon and say hey do you guys what do you think of these and let us have some feedback and what do you think your customers would think and you know it's part of that process and working with them that. Um, you know, they'll say, Hey, we, we really like these. We want to put these on our shelf. And, you know, again, it doesn't need to be this big splash across the country of, of working with every retailer to take a new product and take a new flavor. It's doing it piecemeal and and understanding what works and you'll strategically look at who it makes sense for, and then maybe approach them to release it to that specific, those specific grocery stores. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then it just seems to, to grow from there, right? It's just this sort of organic growth process where we then have data to show what the sales are for that particular flavor. And we have customer feedback and, you know, or they've had feedback from their customers asking for it, right? And so then you can kind of, um, it helps create the picture and create the story that you want to talk to the retailer about to bring it in. Yeah. I mean, it seems from early on, the bag just flew off the shelves. Right, so sales seems like that it's been amazing. Um, what other challenges, or I guess challenges in general, would you say there are with with a company like this? Well, I think I think that's one of them. Just the Is growth, it? right, and mm-hmm. the and the the speed of the growth has been hard to to catch up with and hard to stay um, p- keep pace with. You know, it's it's kind of like catching a tiger by the tail a little bit. Um, and, and, and that presents challenges, right? Like I kind of said, um, having the cash that you need to go on the shelves places, right? Cause you know, what we invoice our customers for isn't necessarily what we get back because, you know, you have to support going on the shelf, right? So some companies, some retailers have slotting fees where you pay to, to go on the shelf. Some, um, retailers, you know, um, uh, want to do certain types of promotions right out of the gate, right. and so you it's know, cutting it's really into just... it's cutting into the profit and everything else. A exactly. Lot. Yeah. Yeah, and and then still having the resources, the financial resources you need to to make product when you're not necessarily getting 
paid on it, right? And so, you know, those are just small business challenges. But but when you yeah. have a company that experiences pretty quick growth, right. sometimes that gets compressed and it gets more intense. Um, because you are trying to, you know, keep up with the retailers that want to put you on the shelf. Um, I think for us, it's been that's been one challenge. I think the, the the larger challenge has just been creating a good supply chain, right? So um, having potatoes available, which are a seasonal crop, yeah. having them available at the time of year that we need them in the quantities that we need them, and also sourcing the coconut oil. Um, mm. And doing that in a financially viable way where we're not, you know, caught because we need some. And, yeah. and we, you know, we've worked hard on that supply chain. And I think that's been the biggest challenge yeah. to get that in place, which, yeah. which we feel really comfortable with yeah. now. There's so many moving parts. I'm getting stressed out hearing about this, actually. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of moving parts. That's a good, good way to describe oh it. Oh, my gosh. Sometimes it feels like you're putting a fire out every day. I'm sure you are. Um, so I always ask this, um, I guess this is Inspired Insider, um, two things. What's been the lowest business moment? Um, and then what's been the proudest business moment for you? Oh, wow. Um, and then with the know, lowest I, one, like how you push through it, you know, after obviously it occurred. I think the lowest would probably be, I don't know if I have one particular event. Yeah. I think it's like, I know, I know, I know something that was real, a real challenge was, um, we were in, when we were first going on the shelf, uh, at natural grocers, it yeah. was, we were getting, shipping the chips and getting them into the warehouses several weeks before they were going to put them on the shelf. So the timing of that was the week that, we were in Washington, D.C. at the National Institute of Health with my son. Mm, right. And so I'd set all everything up before I left. And and it wasn't like I was taking a week vacation because it was just, you know, right. my husband this and I still fun. doing this. This is not a fun trip, right? Yeah. It wasn't a fun trip. Yeah. It wasn't like I was out of pocket and I couldn't be reached. But I thought I had put everything in place that yeah. it was really kind of managing that. Yeah. But what happened was um, – UNFI never told me the very specific delivery instructions that they had for their warehouses. So they have very specific carriers that they like to deliver into their warehouse. And if you don't use one of their carriers, it's a completely different delivery process. Mm. We weren't using their carriers. And so, you know, I thought I'd set everything up and this stuff was just going to go into the warehouse. Um, I started to get calls early that week from the buyer at Natural Grocers asking where all the product was. And and then in researching, like with the trucking company that I had set it up with, they said, oh, we were turned away. Oh, we couldn't deliver. Oh, it's sitting at this terminal. And and then I had to, you know, kind of in the middle of this week with my son, had to figure out this logistics nightmare. Right. Um, that was that felt like a real challenge yeah. because it was really sort of this, right. you know, I had no other experience with right. um with with how much of a big deal this was to me it felt like a really big deal like we weren't going to get on the shelf if i couldn't get these sure. chips into yeah. the warehouse yeah. in in the right time frame um so i think that was a real learning process yeah. for for me and it's yeah. something that's stuck with me i yeah. mean you know we made it work and and we probably paid a ton more than we should have for it um but that that felt like a real challenge and a yeah. real sort of um not sense of defeat, but yeah. you know, it was sort of we are, we aren't even on the shelf yet. Like, let's get on the shelf and 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 get people trying these chips. Like, I don't want this to be sort of self defeating right. with right. with what we're trying to do right here. Yeah. Um, you know, I think I think I've had some really interesting highlights with yeah. the chips. I mean, you know, one of them being hearing people ask for them and and being in the store and seeing them in somebody's grocery cart. I mean, that means a lot to me, and that. Right always I always want to tear up when I see that mm -hmm. um, because when we first started we weren't sure if our friends and family were just being nice to us and saying hey these chips taste really great you should sell them um, you know it was like this real leap of faith when we started offering them to strangers mm -hmm. who you know really don't care about your feelings and won't will will gladly tell you like right. these things taste bad or you know whatever <laughs> and so right. um, so getting that positive feedback uh, initially and then continuing to receive it uh, has been, you know, 
really overwhelming, quite honestly. And then there's like just certain points, I think, throughout this um, experience. I mean, I've had these unbelievable opportunities through the chips and meeting people that, you know, I would never have met in my life without um, having this company. And, and, you know, one that sticks in my head is going to this conference about a year ago. And there was a party at Whole Foods, like at the headquarters. And um, John Mackey was there and he was speaking and, and it was this beautiful, you know, October night in Austin with a local band playing and, and all these people there who are industry leaders. And, and I was there as part of, you know, this sort of innovative uh, company. Right. And it was this surreal moment for me, like, why I am standing on the rooftop deck at Whole Foods mm. headquarters in cool. Austin, like, I'm like a mom of four kids, like a stay-at-home mom forever. What am I doing here? Um, yeah. You know, so it's kind of those like very yeah. sort of um, uh, episodic events that have happened. Uh, but just even going on the shelf at Whole Foods, like I said, or Natural Grocers or Wegmans, yeah. you know, and having people across the country say, oh, I bought your chips. These are great. You know, that's meaningful. Yeah. Amazing. Megan, it is truly amazing. And, you know, how I would have wanted you to respond in that that challenging time is they're mapping my son's genome. Just figure it out. You know, like, <laughs> like what is she talking about? Okay, we'll just not, yeah. we'll just figure it out. Amazing on both accounts. Um, you know, so where should we point people towards right now? I have one last question for you. Where should we point people towards online? Obviously, they could check out Jackson's Honest products at whatever local grocery, Whole Food, or wherever they find on the shelves. Um, what's the the website or maybe social media channels that people should check out for you? Yeah, so the website is jacksonshonest.com. The um, oh, you're gonna put me on the spot with the Twitter. I think it's oh, at Jackson's Twitter, yeah. Honest. I don't know if people that- tend to engage in certain mediums for Jackson's Honest more than others or or not. Um. You know, I think Instagram's been a big um, mm-hmm. a big push for us this year, and we've seen a lot of good activation on Instagram. Yeah. We're we love to do giveaways with other brands. We've got a great one going on right now, um, and and you know, I think for I think what I would ask for kind of a takeaway yeah. is to just you know not necessarily buy our chips, but just check out the story and check out why. You know, just understand the difference between coconut oil or a healthy saturated fat and a polyunsaturated vegetable oil. That's it. You know, just, you know, there's an educational process there and there's a reason um, why one is different than the other. And so, you know, incorporating, um, incorporating those fats into your lifestyle in whatever way, shape or form is possible, um, makes a difference. And it certainly makes a difference if you're struggling with anything that's autoimmune based from, from skin outbreaks like eczema and to, you know, a serious, um, you know, autoimmune disorder like my son or an MS or ALS, you know, that that kind of pro-inflammatory versus anti-inflammatory foods, they matter, particularly when mm. you're, you know, you're facing a real medical challenge. Yeah. And I'll say it. I mean, they should check out the, uh, check out the story, but they should also buy the chips. They're, they're really good. <laughs> I mean, like I said, I would have them here to show up, but I, but I uh, ate them all. Um, last question, <laughs> Megan, is just from this journey, I mean, it's been crazy family journey, crazy, you know, business journey. Um, what's um, what should we leave people with? Whether it's a big takeaway or a big lesson so far. You know, I think it's really just keeping keeping it positive. Like for 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 me and the business, and you know, having the response that we've had, mm-hmm. my personal life and my family. Um, you know, it felt for, for several years really bleak, um, Mm. um, with my son and what he was facing and not having any answers. And yet, you know, we continue to move forward and try to keep searching and, and keep trying to understand how we could help him. And so, um, you know, we always tried to keep it in this, in this positive place, not knowing how long, you know, he would be with us and we'd have him in our life. And so, um, every day had to count because of that. And, and it still does. And so 
you know, that's what I think is, is my priority and it, through the business as well as through, you know, my home life is, um, really taking something that seems negative, um, or, you know, sort of a lemon and turning it into lemonade and making it into something really positive. Yeah. Meg, I want to be the first one. Thank you so much. I really appreciate what you do. And, um, you know, thanks again. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah. It's been great to speak with you. Yes. I've had a good time. You too. Thanks. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire. Came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.